Thank you very much. Well, actually, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's I'm best uh, prepared to give you this presentation or Nick, because every time I hear from Nick, he's either doing the centrifuge or doing another parabolic flight, and I feel like I'm, I'm trying to keep up with, uh, with his training program rather than vice versa. But, but hopefully this evening I'll give you a little bit of an insight of what I've been doing since 2009, as Nick said, when I was recruited into the European Astronaut Corps, and um, talk a little bit about the next steps, where those next footprints might be uh, on which celestial body and uh, again happy to just go into more uh, during the question and answer session on that as well. So unsurprisingly I'm going to start off talking about the International Space Station because <coughs> this is our focus for all the European astronauts at the moment and also my colleagues in NASA, in Russia, in JAXA and in Canada. Uh, we're all focusing on doing a long duration tour to the ISS between now and 2020 and also, I think it's highly likely that we'll see the lifetime of the ISS go on beyond 2020 to maybe 2025. So the International Space Station, it's up there somewhere around sort of 340 kilometres. Actually, today it's, a, it's nearly 400 kilometres. So it's a very low Earth orbit. 340 kilometres is London to Paris, so not very far. Uh, because it's in such a low orbit, it's going extremely fast. Um, that velocity there equates to about 17,000 miles per hour, which is 10 times the speed of the, of the bullet that comes out of the Apache that I fly. Um, and again, taking the London to Paris analogy, 340 kilometres, you'll get there in 45 seconds on the ISS, London to Paris. <coughs> Going that fast, it does nearly 16 orbits every day. So it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. Um, so the crew, when they're in that working environment, one of, the, one of the first things they have to get used to is their circadian rhythms because the diurnal variation, every 90 minutes they're orbiting the Earth, so sun rising, sun setting all the time. And uh, they're in an artificial light environment mainly, but they do get the opportunity to see day and night and they do experience that on board the station. So that, that kind of affects them. Um, this slide is going to just show you, it's kind of a fast forward of how the ISS was assembled. And in the bottom left hand of the screen around here, um, you're going to see some numbers changing. Every time that changes, it represents a new mission, a, a new um, uh, construction launch that went on to assemble the ISS. And um, really, the ISS was uh, a concept that began in, in 94, um, and it was a synthesis of many space stations. The Americans were keen to have space station freedom, as it was then called. The Russians were very keen to have Mir-2. Europe wanted to launch the Columbus Laboratory. Japan wanted to launch the Kibo. And so this international collaboration which was formed, which was probably the best thing you could have possibly done in human spaceflight, because international collaboration brings stability to the program. And that stability has seen us through till now, and it will see us <coughs> through to the next 10 years. So I'll start this um, slide running just showing you the, the concept of how it was built. The shuttle and the proton, the Russian, rock, the, the Russian launch of the proton, were really the, the mainstays of constructing the International Space Station, with the shuttle really taking on the, the main load. Um, to date, there is over 400 tonnes of hardware that's gone up there, so the, the uh, entire space station itself is about the size of an American football field, over 400 tonnes, about 16 pressurised modules... And the internal volume equates to something like a 747-400. So there's a big internal volume in there as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, over 50% of the pressurized modules have actually been built in Europe. So although people don't think that we have a, a big participation in the ISS, we are, have been very influential in constructing this, uh, this space station. So that shows you the, how the International State Space Station has been put together. Anyone who can spot the mistake during that construction process, speak to me afterwards and you get a prize. <laughs> <laughs> there was one mistake during that that, does, that uh, the ISS is not quite the way you see it there, but it's, it's almost the way that you see it. It was uh, it, the first two units, Zarya and Unity, which really followed on from the Shuttle Mir project. They were launched in 1998, but the ISS wasn't occupied until... 2000 when the Russian service module went up there and this was the first crew and the commander was uh, this chap in the centre where's my laser pointer gone anyway chap in the centre Bill Shepard who was the first commander of the ISS and um, 
and his uh, two compa- uh, colleagues on the left-hand side, Sergei Krikalev and Yuri Gitsenko on the right-hand side. And nine years later, pretty much, was when the crew expanded to six. Now, this was important because during that time, the main emphasis and the focus was on the construction of the ISS. Uh, there wasn't so much scientific research being done. When the crew went to six, this marked the phase of when the construction of the ISS was ramping down and the scientific research was ramping up. And uh, Gennady Padalka, who is second from the left on the bottom row, he was the first commander of this crew of six. And on the bottom left there is Frank Devin, who is my current boss, European astronaut, Belgian nationality, and he commanded the space station after Gennady. So that was a big moment for Europe. And the current crew today who are up there as I speak uh, are these fine gentlemen. And Kevin Ford on the left here is commanding. Chris Hadfield on the bottom right, he will take over from Kevin. And he'll be the first Canadian commander of the International Space Station. Now, controlling the space station is a very complex project because of this international collaboration, which is great on the one hand. It also means that everybody has a share of the pie. So you have Mission Control Center in Houston, Mission Control Center Moscow, Munich, Columbus Control Center, you've got JAXA Control Center, and you've got Huntsville um, doing payloads. They're the five kind of big control centers. So you can imagine that um, coordinating all of this activity is very complex. And one of our jobs, as Nick alluded to and he was introducing me, is to do the Eurocom. And this is the equivalent of Capcom, and I'm sure... Everybody is familiar with a uh, photograph on the bottom right there, Charlie Duke during the Apollo 11 moon landing when he was Capcom for those famous words. Um, to be quite frank, things haven't really changed since 69. Uh, it's just we've got colour screens. But um, <laughs> it's very much a similar environment. Our job as, as Eurocom is you try and have an astronaut who does that role with the interface between this enormous ground support team, which is very complex, and we're the ones who chat to the guys on board the station, most of whom are our, our colleagues and friends. And our job is to try and put all of this information that is coming from scientific teams, from engineering teams, just into layman's terms at an appropriate time and um, in an appropriate manner so that we can help the crew on board. So talking of the crew, the activity, they are working pretty hard, so you're getting uh, a good deal for your taxpayers' money. They're, normally their daily planning conference, it starts at 8 a.m., which is finished by 8 a.m., the 8 a.m. they start work, working through till about uh, 7 p.m. At, uh, in the evenings. Um, and the main focus is to do the scientific research with maintenance activities as well, I says maintenance. Um, <clears throat> We, as Eurocom, we keep them on a tight timeline. So this is our job, really, is to be listening in all all of these loops. You have to have good situational awareness. You're talking to your colleagues in Houston, your colleagues in Moscow, at uh, POIC in Huntsville. And the idea is always to stay one or two steps ahead of the crew, reading their procedures, making sure you know exactly what they're doing, what's coming up. So you anticipate all the questions they might have, all the problems they might have. So we keep them on their timeline and we make sure that by the end of the day, we have achieved everything that is on this list, if not some more. We try and even get some get-aheads as well um, because then the crew will need to go into preparation for the following day's work. So they work Monday to Friday on that timeline. Saturday morning is cleaning morning for the whole crew. And um, no joke, it's, it's spent doing the, the primary cleaning maintenance for the station. And then Saturday afternoon is when the crew have the option to do what's called voluntary science. And because the scientific research is so valuable in terms of crew time, that's what we really want to try and maximise. Um, if the crew are willing to hand over their Saturday afternoon to science, then they do so. Most of the crew members do that. So Saturday afternoon to voluntary science. Sunday is the day where they truly have a day off on board the station. Um, it is filled with a few conferences. They get the opportunity to speak to a doctor once a week with a private medical conference. You can have private psychological conferences and, most importantly, private <coughs> family conferences. So um, the uh, NASA or ESA or Jack CSA will actually go to the family's home and set up a video conferencing suite in your family home so that on board the station you can have a nice uh, video conference with your family once a week. In addition to that, of course, the ISS is quite a modern complex now with every crew member having iPads and there's Wi-Fi. So you can tweet, you can blog, you can Facebook. um, And NASA have actually installed uh, an app 
on the iPad for enabling FaceTime with your uh, families as well. So uh, in this day and age, the crew do have lots of access to social media and to interacting. And of course, today, I mean, we've, we've seen, for example, the photographs that Chris Hadfield is sending down at the moment, tweeting down from the ISS. He's doing a fantastic job and some very inspirational photos coming back. But as I mentioned a couple of times, the main focus is on, on research and getting our value for money now as a scientific laboratory. The crew set a record last week with 67 hours dedicated to pure scientific research. And that's going up and up every week, every month, because the maintenance activities are getting less and they're getting faster and the scientific return is getting better. Columbus Laboratory on the left-hand side is at the front of the station in terms of the orbital plane in the direction it's flying. So uh, Columbus and uh, Japan's Kibo Laboratory, they'll get hit first by any debris. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Uh, and uh, so that's the location where most of the, most of the European science is done. Columbus is, has kind of migrated towards being a human physiology module. There's lots of uh, human physiology uh, payloads are in there, and that's where lots of that kind of science is done. Um, some of the most interesting science, I think, being done on the station at the moment is medical research, not just in terms of human physiology for the sake of space exploration. That's very important. <coughs> There's a lot of work going on to that. But a spin-off, if you like, from that, the fact that it's been discovered that viruses have become more virulent in a microgravity environment, not quite sure why, but they are, makes it an excellent environment in which to study vaccines. The body's immune system becomes depleted in a microgravity environment. So with those two, studying of vaccines, immune systems, uh, pharmaceutical companies are very interested now in using the microgravity environment for research. And I think we're going to start seeing some very interesting medical data coming out of the research that's been going on at the moment. Uh, an example of that is uh, salmonella vaccine has already been produced based on the ISS research. MRSA has flown on the ISS and that's being worked on now. So we may see other, vac other viruses being taken on board the ISS for investigation. Um, and the crew do get involved hands-on on things like biological experiments, fluid physics, material science um, experiments as well. In terms of the ISS orbit, it, uh, it's launched uh, into a 51.6 degree inclination. That's the orbital inclination of the space station. The reason for that is the Russians. When they were a, a partner, um, they, their launch site is Baikonur, which is about 45 degrees. And they couldn't launch at that inclination because otherwise the, the boosters would drop on China, which wouldn't be very popular. <laughs> so to stop the boosters from dropping on China, 51.6 was the chosen inclination. And it's, in some respects, people thought that wasn't a great orbit because you can, you can use a, an equatorial orbit, for example, is much better if you want to do lunar exploration and beyond. But what it does mean is that it's a great platform for things like Earth observation and giving us the, the extra science that we can get from weather um, and satellite coverage. It actually covers 75% of the, the Earth's surface and 95% of the habitated lands. And so from an Earth observation point of view, the Earth's rotating underneath the ISS, so on every orbit, it's about 22.5 degrees shift, which is why you're seeing these yellow lines shifting left. That's the, the, the orbits of the ISS as it, as it goes round. So you get some fantastic Earth observation, and things like shipping antennas are currently being used on board the space station to monitor worldwide shipping traffic. Um, so it's a great platform for that. And we get to watch extremely good videos such as this one, which is an exposure taken every 30 seconds at night time, which just gives you an idea of what our beautiful planet looks by night.
And Nasser astronaut Don Pettit did a great job in setting up the, the cameras for much of the, the photography that you saw there. So the launch vehicles that have um, serviced the ISS and continue to do so, obviously the shuttle retired last year, but I put it up there just a, as a comparison of the payloads there along the top, payload to low Earth, or, low Earth orbit. And as I said, the shuttle and the Proton were really the two that um, took up most of the, the modules for the ISS, with the Proton delivering all the Russian modules and the shuttle pretty much doing everything else. Uh, Ariane 5 ES there is in the centre, Europe's launcher, launches from um, Karoo in French Guiana, and then Jap Japan has the H2B launcher on the right there, which launches their cargo vehicle. The left-hand side, quite a lightweight by comparison, is where the Soyuz sits, launches both the crew and the Progress. And from my perspective, from the astronaut's perspective at the moment, this is the most important launcher up there because it's the one that takes us to space, and it's the only one at the moment that takes us to space and will be for the foreseeable future. So from that respect, we train in the simulators in Star City, Moscow, and the European seat in the Soyuz is traditionally the left-hand seat, which is where I'm sat there. Um, and as a left-hand seat uh, you, uh, astronaut, so you have to be trained up to the same <coughs> level as the commander. So it does require quite a lot of extra training than the right-hand seat, which is sometimes um, unfairly just called the tourist seat. It's not. There's actually, <laughs> there's actually quite a few important jobs to do in the right-hand seat, but uh, the left-hand seat does require a lot more training. Um, I think one nice way of describing the Soyuz would be a, a wonderful mix of old and new technology. Um, from a test pilot perspective, I'd call it an ergonomical nightmare. Uh, for example, you have these big clunky oxygen O2 valve on-off switches that haven't changed since really the 70s and 80s in terms of their design, their progress, combined with glass cockpit technology. But the old Russian adage of if it ain't broke, then uh, don't fix it really applies here. And I think it's a fantastic vehicle. It's very reliable. It's typically Russian. I had the benefit of flying some Russian helicopters prior to um, leaving the army as a test pilot. And really, their spacecraft are just like their helicopters. They're, <laughs> they're solid, uh, indestructible. Uh, this is the, the actual vehicle that ends up in space, with this capsule here in the center being where the crew sit, and this being the habitu uh, habitation module where the crew can actually get out the seat and go and uh, change and relieve themselves in this module here f um, and feed themselves, etc., during the two-day rendezvous. Now, at the moment, in March this year, the crew is going to do a six-hour rendezvous. It's going to be the first time the crew have done it. They did that last year with a progress vehicle, and it was <coughs> successful. And so um, uh, it'd be interesting to see how that goes and also what the crew think of it. Some crew members think it's a good thing in terms of spending a shorter duration in the Soyuz and getting onto the ISS. Some crew members think that actually by the time you come to do the rendezvous and docking stage, by that time you're actually pretty tired. You've had a long day and all of the preparation. You've gone through a launch. You've sat in your seat for 11 hours. Uh, and there's no opportunity for the left seat, for example, to even leave the seat. And then you're just into the very, very hard, demanding phase of rendezvous and docking at, at probably your, your lowest ebb. So it'll be interesting to hear the feedback. I'm generally uh, interested to see how that goes. But I think that we will probably see this six-hour um, rendezvous becoming more common. The ATV has crew uh, impact as well, uh, interaction. This is the, pr the cargo vehicle that Europe supplies. It's arguably the most sophisticated spacecraft flying because it's fully autonomous um, and it provides power, water, gas, uh, hardware to the, uh, to the crew when it docks. It's about the size of a London bus and weighs 20 tonnes thereabouts. And you see here Thomas Pesquet, the French astronaut, part of our training is to actually monitor the rendezvous and docking sequence. Um, and again, it's this wonderful mix of old and new technology. The ATV is a fairly sophisticated vehicle, but it docks onto the Russian segment. So we're actually training with Russian equipment here for the docking. Uh, and you might notice a plastic ruler and a small black and white screen. That is actually how we dock the ATV. We, uh, we monitor its progress. We monitor its rate of closure and its approach angle by using the, the rulers there. And they give us a, a big red button if things are really bad and a big orange button if things are bad, but not that bad. I'm, I'm not convinced that they're actually attached to anything. I think, it's, 
I think it's just to make us feel better on orbit, but um, they probably don't actually do anything. But uh, we're told that no, the astronaut in the loop is actually uh, has direct command capability of the ATV if we did need to abort um, or hold the ATV docking sequence. So we train quite, uh, quite significantly for that. The new generation SpaceX then, uh, I don't really need to say too much about this, I expect most of you have heard a lot about it, launched from a, a Falcon 9, and um, very successful mission last year with its first operational cargo mission, and subsequently this year we're going to see SpaceX launching again. Takes up about six tonnes worth of cargo, but the most important thing at the moment about SpaceX is this bit down here, I think, because it brings down two and a half tonnes of cargo. It's the only thing that can bring... Now the shuttle is retired, they can bring anything significant down from the space station. There's only so much room in the Soyuz underneath the cruise seats, you can't really bring a huge amount down. So SpaceX is really fulfilling that capability. All the other launch vehicles, their, their uh, payloads burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. And very shortly we'll also see Orbital join the club um, with uh, their Cygnus vehicle here, which will bring up two tonnes of cargo. But again, this one burns up in the Earth's atmosphere, so it can't return anything. I can't do a speak to uh, you without mentioning Skylon. This is the next generation, of course, which we want to see, is uh, Skylon docked to the International Space Station. The reason I mention those, uh, SpaceX and, and Orbital Cygnus, for example, is because they're free flyers, like the Japanese HTV, the heavy transport vehicle. They have no automatic docking capability, so they park themselves about 10 metres below the International Space Station. That's HTV there. And it's up to the astronauts to grapple it and berth it to the ISS. This is a pretty demanding task. Uh, and it's, again, it's an area we'd spend a lot of time training for. You have about a 90-second window to capture that HTV and then, then berth it. Um, because that vehicle is using propellant to station keep. Because it's, it, although it's only 10 metres below, it's in a different orbit. Therefore, it wants to go faster and therefore it's using up propellant to maintain its position. But it can't have propellant when you're actually going for the grapple, so they have to cease all motion. So you're now capturing a moving object and you have 90 seconds to do it. To practice for that, we use simulators, starting off with basic simulators here in, in Cologne. We have a, a robotics trainer which goes on uh, and teaches us the, the, the elementary stuff. And then this is a, a more advanced simulator at NASA within the uh, cupola setup. Uh, and a lot of the robotics training is also done by Canada as well because the robotic arm, the main one, is, is the Canada arm. Uh, I have to say, as a helicopter pilot, I love robotics and I think I've got an unfair advantage because we are simply much more used to dealing with things in six axes, X, Y, Z, pitch, roll, yaw. Um, and not everybody is, is quite so familiar with those control inputs. You do need a lot of spatial awareness um, to, to be good at robotics tasks. But uh, it's very demanding, but also very rewarding. You always have two crew doing this as well, one who's primary and one who is backup, who is monitoring all the cameras. And needless to say, like most of these things, we have an enormous amount of support from the ground as well doing these tasks. Station maintenance then. The ISS shares space with a lot of uh, other debris, thousands and thousands of pieces of debris. And unfortunately, uh, that, that's becoming more and more at the moment. Even things as small as five millimetres or less, when they're going six kilometres a second, do damage like that and like that to the ISS. So it's constantly being bombarded. Um, and now that the construction phase is complete, people thought the rate of EVA, which is the extravehicular activity or spacewalking, was going to decline. The reality is that things are starting to break now. The station needs more maintenance. And only last year we <coughs> saw... Sonny Williams and uh, Aki Hoshidi doing two EVAs at the very end of their six-month tour, which was completely unscheduled maintenance, one to repair an a, a electrical unit and one because there was a sp suspected ammonia leak because of micrometeorite damage. Um, both those EVAs were very successful, but what's interesting is that during the construction phase, of course, the crews would practice their EVI, EVAs again and again and again in the neutral buoyancy laboratory in Houston, and they'd be extremely familiar with exactly what they were going to do. Now, with these kind of things, uh, the crew don't know what they could be asked to do, and uh, they haven't practiced it in the MBL, and it's, uh, we're now getting into the mindset of, of how do you train more generically so that you can go out on an EVA and be ready for anything. 
EVA training starts again for us in Cologne with uh, a fairly basic setup, but it actually does the job. It really just introduces us into what it's like in the uh, neutral buoyancy environment and gets us familiar with the controls and the procedures and the communication. This is uh, all land training I did it about a year ago in Russia on the, uh, their spacesuit. And then we progress onto the EMU, the uh, EVA Maneuverability Europe, uh, Unit, which is uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center. Uh, I think this is, it must be nearly the largest pool in the world, if not uh, very, one of the top 10. It's absolutely enormous, 12 meters deep. And in that pool has been sunk most of the modules of the International Space Station. And it's just a fantastic environment just to scuba dive around, <laughs> let alone go in an EMU suit and actually work on the station. Um, it is particularly challenging, though. I really, really love this training. And um, I was surprised, actually, how physically demanding it was and how mentally challenging it was. Spending six hours in that EVA suit, EMU suit, um, is, is very much hard work. Just moving your arms and moving your fingers in a pressurized suit is hard work. But you also have to work with multiple different pieces of tools and equipment. And you certainly sleep well after six hours in the suit. Um, so I've spent a lot of time last year, seven months in the US. Part of my time was training on this suit, getting through about 10 runs in the pool. And I'm now qualified on the EMU suit. And I'll see this again for refresher training and Hopefully, when I'm assigned, I will then start doing uh, more training on this as well. <coughs> EVA execution, this is where the fun really starts. This is Krista Fugelsang on one of his five EVAs. He's outside of um, Russian cosmonauts and NASA astronauts. He's the most qualified uh, EVA person. Um, the suit, obviously, with all the thermal protection, has to uh, protect against the rigors of space of, of about plus 120 to minus 155 degrees C micrometeorites, as I mentioned, and thermal control and radiation exposure, day-night variations. So very complex life support systems. It gives you about nine hours worth of operation, which is pretty good. And actually, you probably want to come in after nine hours of, of EVA anyway. So uh, it's a very sophisticated suit. And um, it, it's, you know, you really, you, although I say it's hard to work in, you do have a lot of dexterity. You can get a lot of tasks done. The suit is old, though, very old, and they're designing a new one. It, ha it does cause some injuries. Lots of people get shoulder injuries just getting into and out of the suit because it's a, a solid, the, the breastplate there is a solid unit. Um, caving experience actually helps because you have to kind of go in underneath it and, and put your arms in and put your arms out like that. I'm a small guy, and I, I sometimes struggle, but even after I've struggled, people say, wow, that was easy. And I thought, wow, if that's easy, what are, the, what are the big guys having to do then? You know, some people do spend five minutes just getting through that portion. And the, the way that the uh, shoulders are designed, they kind of hunches you forward a little bit, so you can't use a lot of the, the major muscle groups. So a lot of the small muscle groups are doing a lot of the work. So people, for example, come out with torn rotator cuff muscles, for example. So our sports physiologists give us very good training programs in the gym so that we build up all of the small muscle groups that they know that we're going to need for operating this suit. Uh, this is the camp out procedure beforehand. Obviously, it's a bit similar to being in a diving environment where you're um, going to be working in a low pressure and you're breathing in mixed air. So you need to try and flush as much nitrogen from the body as possible beforehand. So the crew's Breathe 100% oxygen for time before the EVA. So I've covered quite <coughs> a few of these pieces here of, of the general astronaut training that we do. And really, I equate it to having to be a jack of all trades and hopefully a master of one or two. Um, <laughs> but really, it's a fascinating environment. And uh, you do get exposed to many, many different facets of uh, working for many different people and many different facets of training. Um, and of course, I have to mention this as well, because on top of everything else, it's the best job in the world because I also get to go back to the army every now and again and fly my first love, which is this lovely aircraft here. Um, now I'd like to focus a little bit on to where are we going, having spoken a little bit about astronaut training. Um, I wonder if anyone can help me on this because <laughs> it would be fair to say there is a slight lack of focus at the moment as to where we are going. But I think it uh, is quite clear that ultimately Mars is our destination. Um, 
And that's where we're working towards. Now the question is, okay, how do we get there? What stepping stones do we take? Are we going to an asteroid in the 2020s, which is NASA's current official vision? Or will we go back to the moon? Will the old constellation program be reborn? Will we go to Earth, moon, Lagrange point in a deep space habitat? Uh, And so these are the the areas that are being discussed at the moment. And again, it's fair to say that NASA still really leads the way. So we suffer from uh, any problems that NASA might be having, having knock-on effects as well. And we haven't really had international collaboration yet on the next big step, with the exception of paperwork in terms of global exploration strategy, for example. And that's all very, very good work. But in terms of actually big decisions and making hardware, um, international collaboration has only just come, which was brilliant news, as Nick alluded to in the ministerial, which at least ties in Europe and that, and that was the MPCV, which I'll talk about in a second. So uh, it's more a case, I think, of of a capability is being built. And it's a bit like the tail wagging the dog. In the 60s, you had President Kennedy saying, we'll go to the moon and we build what we need to go to the moon. We are now, or NASA is now building capability, and Europe too is is starting now to build capability, uh, and it's going to have multiple uses in terms of a destination, which is not a bad thing. Um, Ideally, you would want to set a destination. You would like to have stability in knowing that destination. But by starting to build a capability, we have the the SLS, or Space Launch System, which I heard being referred to last week as the Senate Launch System, (laughs) which kind of highlights uh, the political difficulties there are in the US in terms of building something like that. It's going to be a monster. The 130-ton version will be, if it's built, the largest, most powerful rocket ever built, five times or greater payload than five, five shuttles. And Lockheed Martin on the right there building the the multi-purpose crew vehicle, the MPCV, which is going to be a a four-seater spacecraft. Uh, First launched in 2014 on top of the Delta IV, uh, and then it will be launched in 2017 on top of the SLS. And the 2017 will be unmanned, go around the moon, and come in at about 11 kilometres per second, which will be the fastest re-entry to date of any spacecraft into the Earth's atmosphere. Having done the 2017 test, 2021 will be the first manned flight doing a similar profile, a translunar profile. Um, And I've mentioned this, the ESA NASA Corporation of the MPCV. The ATV will live on. We've got another two ATVs to deliver, one this year and one in 2014. But the technology is going to go into the service module for the MPCV, which is fantastic, I think. Um, It really ties us in. It gives us that stability, and it ties us in with a deep space exploration program. With these two combined, we will have the capability to, uh, or NASA and ESA will have the capability to do those 2017 and 2021 missions that I spoke about. And then from here, we can build in habitation modules, which will enable us to then look at, for example, Earth, Moon, Lagrange points. And I think that's the way of the future. I think that's what we're going to see, is we're going to see this capabilities being built, and then that will drive the destinations that we go to. And hopefully in time, we will then start seeing either a lunar lander or a Mars lander or asteroid space exploration vehicles on this package, and the package will grow, and that will expand the destinations that we can go to. So I've spoken a bit about asteroids. They became very close to my heart last year when I was in Russia, and my boss phoned me up and said, would you like to go on a NEMO mission? And uh, that is the NASA's Extreme Environments Mission Operations. And uh, I, I absolutely jumped at the chance. It would be fascinating and, and fantastic to go on that. So I spent a little bit of time last year learning about asteroids. And this was kind of what NASA are looking at at the moment, this kind of mission profile, 70 days there and back, with a two-week exploration phase. Obviously, asteroids offer huge uh, potential in terms of scientific research <coughs> there, four and a half billion years worth of solar system history. So they're kind of precious artifacts out there where we can learn a lot about our creation. And they're also, um, from a resource potential, they're precious metals in terms of uh, nickels and irons, etc., platinum, silicon, and more recently, water and ice, which could be a a source of fuel in the asteroid belt, a lot of water and ice on, on asteroids as well. So from a resource point of view, they're very important as well. But the thing that always grabs Hollywood, of course, and the media, 
is the impact ex uh, area. Uh, and it's true to say that we will get hit by a big asteroid in the future, certain. It's just a matter of when. Thankfully, probably not within the next 100 years. But what I do want to show you is this sequence which I saw last year, and I just thought it emphasizes how rapidly we have learned about asteroids and I think still how little we know. And in 1800, we knew nothing about asteroids, zero. 50 years later, we had 10 of them. Um, 1900, a few more. 1950, 2000. 9,000, 19, 2,000, we're up to 90,000 now, and we've got some red ones in there, and the red ones are Earth-crossing asteroids. 2007, we're nearly at 400,000, and a couple of weeks ago when I checked the NASA website, we're on 583,000 objects out there, um, but really the estimation is millions, because they just know that we haven't really even started looking seriously. Um, the red ones you see are all Earth crosses, so we've got 9,655 near-Earth objects. Of those, 1,391 are potentially hazardous objects, so they are being monitored. And of the potentially hazardous objects, 154 are greater than one kilometre. One kilometre asteroid is, is catastrophic. If it impacted the Earth, it's absolutely catastrophic event. So the fact that we already know of 154 of them that are potentially hazardous to the Earth is, uh, just highlights that they are a threat. And um, we've had some asteroid events recently in 2011. A 360 metre diameter, that's, that's big, uh, came between us and the Moon. And the bottom two there, Apophysis and uh, 2011 AG5. These have been in the press recently. Now, these have kind of been downgraded. There's a very, probably a very low probability of either of these impacting the Earth. Um, but uh, Apophysis was, uh, was going, or is going to have a 2029 close approach. And also, this asteroid here, 140 meter diameter. Uh, is going to have a, uh, a viewing later in September this year. We'll be able to refine the orbit of that asteroid in more detail. But a little bit closer to home, what are you all doing next Friday? <laughs> At about this time, next Friday, 45-metre uh, diameter is coming within the geosynchronous orbit. So if your Sky TV goes off air next Friday night, you'll know why, because this is coming even between. And 45 meter diameter is probably about the same size that hit in 1908 in Tunguska, uh, with a force of about 1,000 Hiroshima's and wiped out 1,500 square kilometers. So it's small, but it's still, if it hits the wrong part of the planet, it's still bad news. Um, so. They do happen, and um, they will happen in the future. So the fact that we're becoming more aware of it, we're monitoring it, and hopefully, um, you know, in a, in a hundred years' time, when there may be uh, a large one to have to deal with, we will have the technology to do something about it. And this is where NEMO 16 comes in. It was looking at visiting an asteroid, primarily because we want to go there and we want to try and develop, on the NEMO 16, we're looking at developing all the tools, techniques, and procedures, so de-risking the mission. It's the first steps, using what's called a space analog. Um, and what could be a better space analog than just going down to the bottom of the ocean, where you've got a huge environment where you can be in <coughs> neutral buoyancy and you can try out all sorts of tools and techniques. Uh, and this is, again, the artist impression, and this on the right is exactly what we were doing, using deep worker submersibles um, and using foot plates on the, on the bottom of them. Aquarius was the habitat that enabled us to do it, and it's the last one in the world at the moment, the only underwater habitat, and even Aquarius this year may shut because of lack of funding, which would be a great shame. But it was my home for 12, uh, 12 days, and it was a, an absolute highlight of my career to date. Um, as both a, a pilot and an astronaut. It was a, a real pleasure to be involved in this mission. Uh, from a professional perspective, we had a mission control center that were on the Florida Keys in a car park. Um, NASA had sent their big articulated expandable truck with 80 personnel supporting us, just like a, a proper mobile mission control center. We had a 50 second communication delay simulating that kind of 15 million kilometer distance um, type mission profile. Uh, this is, shows the Aquarius habitat on the, the top left there with the dining table, our iPad communications, which we're, we're testing out all sorts of different apps, um, which will hopefully be flown later this year on board the space station. And it really is the way to go. I think we can save at least 
somewhere between 30 to 40 minutes of every crew member by some of the things that we were trialling on those uh, iPads in terms of voice communications, procedure viewers, just taking photographs of things. At the moment, if the crew on board the station need to photo document something, it's going to take a camera, take a shot, get the SD card into the laptop, download it. With these things, it was a case of iPad, photo, send, email, gone, and you're off onto the next task. That kind of thing that just speeds everything up and you get more value for money out of your crew time. Um, this is the work center on board Aquarius. That's uh, uh, my Japanese colleague who's about to go diving. And on the bottom right, you see a, more of a, a bird's eye view of Aquarius. The, the little white uh, module there on the side of it is the gazebo, which is our um, life uh, or emergency evacuation chamber, if like, if we had a fire or if we had a, a catastrophic um, event on board the Aquarius habitat we would all six crew members be able to go into there. It also functioned as a lavatory, which was, <laughs> was probably the most distressing and least pleasant element of the entire <laughs> mission. Um, I can elaborate if people really want me to on that. Um, and what I'd like to do now is just to show you a, a short video which kind of highlights the Nemo mission.
Test director is ready to disconnect. Blue Diver, Aquarius, copy. So it's certainly good to see the sun again after 12 days, but I would, on the other hand, I would have happily stayed down there for uh, another two or three weeks. It was just a, a wonderful environment and a, and a great mission. So on that note, um, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Great speech, Tim. Thanks very much. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here then. Um, so, as we understand then, the UK have put this money into the ATV being the service module for um, what I call Orion. Um, and the second mission is going to uh, fly the first men to the moon, hopefully, for uh, a number of years. Given that UK investment, does that, uh, does that give you a kind of priority, do you think, in uh, a seat? I think uh, sort of what, what it is fantastic news and uh, very positive obviously for the UK industry as well because we can have got industry involved in this um, and as well as myself. It actually opens up potential in ISS as well as MPCV and yes certainly the UK is now part of the club if you like. They always were and you know the Director General of Evisa was very generous in his words when I was selected and the fact that he was always going to fly me but of course, the ministerial was very positive last year, and that's a good thing. Um, and it's a good thing for now. It's a good thing for the future. And this is what MPCV and the service module really is. It's all about the next steps in the future. So I really hope we see a European astronaut on board Orion on one of these deep space missions, yes. Um, there are only four seats, so they're going to be hard won by and hard fought. And, and also, these launches aren't going to be anything near as, as the frequency that we're witnessing with the Soyuz and the ISS at the moment. Um, but I certainly think that Europe has done enough to guarantee a, a seat on the Orion at some point. Would that be you? I would love it to be me. <laughs> um, however, obviously, France and Germany are also contributing a large sum of money into this program as well. So there is, contra there, there is competition. Have you done any training with the Dragon spaceship at all? Because with that upcoming as the crew vehicle to ISS, is, is it definite that you would be flying the Soyuz, or is this any element of doubt? At the moment, all of the uh, serious crew training is on the Soyuz in terms of uh, <coughs> spacecraft that's <coughs> taking astronauts. The Dragon training that's being done for the crews is all in terms of um, grappling with the robotics and berthing and operating the Dragon once it's attached to the station as a cargo vessel. That's where all the training is focused. But it's fair to say that there are uh, working groups at the astronaut branch within NASA who are clearly working with SpaceX on the, the seven-seater variant of, of the Dragon Rider. Um, and I, I think uh, about 2018 was the latest I heard a projected crude version of that. Unfortunately, it's kind of slipped back from what was originally maybe 2015, 2016. I'm now hearing 2018. <coughs> Absolutely. So at the appropriate time, the crew members will get involved in, in a sufficient lead-in time to be prepared for that. But the Soyuz is going to be the mainstay for the next three or four years at least. Yes, Are you a fluent Russian speaker? <laughs> um, I, I'm not fluent Russian speaker. I, I'm kind of intermediate high Russian speaker um, and I, I'm very happy understanding Russian. Um, there's a big gap between understanding and speaking. <laughs> um, but no, my Russian is progressing and I, I have about four hours of Russian <coughs> lessons every week when I'm, when I'm in Cologne. Um, and a, as do all the NASA astronauts and as do my European colleagues. So we're all focusing on, on Russian. So really you expect to be... Uh, yes. Yeah. And it's very important for European astronauts as the left-hand seat in the Soyuz, you really have to be on your game. Uh, and also, if you want the opportunity to ha perhaps do a, an EVA with the Russians in the Orlan suit, um, the training I did there in Russia last year was all in Russian, no translation. Yeah. 
at all. So you're just there in the suit, listening to Russian, speaking Russian back. But actually that part of it's quite easy because you've spent the night before studying your procedures and work, working in Russian procedurally as opposed to conversationally, procedurally is much, much easier in a working environment. It's then when you kind of um, you know, go for a drink later with your Russian <coughs> colleagues and you get into conversational Russian, that's when it becomes very hard. Yes, sir. We have we have two members in ESA who are learning Mandarin at the moment. One, Tom Apeske, uh, the French astronaut, and one of our managers, and they've been learning Mandarin for about a year now. They just got back from a two-week visit to China, um, and last September, the Chinese Space Agency visited ESA. So. ESA really are the ones who are paving the way forward in this relationship with China. And I think we're best placed to do that. NASA obviously have their limitations on what they can do, uh, as do Russia. So Europe, we're really kind of, uh, in terms of this international collaboration, we have a very important role to play there. So it'll be very interesting to see how, the, how that develops, that relationship between ESA and China. Yes, Richard. You mentioned this uh, six-hour trip uh, on the Soyuz from launch to the space station. Yes. I mean, what are you, you said you'd be interested to see the outcome. I gather it's pretty unpleasant at the moment with a couple of days. Um, it's, it's not that unpleasant, actually. I, I think that, um, you know, the crews, once they've got over the launch sequence and, and they're going through their phasing, then um, the Soyuz is a cramped environment, certainly for two days. Um, but it's not, it's not that unpleasant. There are, there are a number of reasons to why you want to shift to a, a six-hour one, and <coughs> part of that is just to be more efficient in terms of cost as well. It's a lot cheaper if you can just do it in six hours, a six-hour launch. Um, but the Soyuz does have quite a lot, post-launch, the Soyuz does have quite a lot of rotation involved, um, and that can be quite nauseating for the crew. So that's another concern, is the two days allows you time to adapt to the space environment. Many astronauts suffer space adaptation syndrome, they call it, but you know, basically feeling sick um, following, um, following the launch. And the Soyuz doesn't help that. So the fact that you're then going to go into this rapid rendezvous and docking, it will be interesting to see uh, the results from it. Yes, sir. Um, firstly, thank you, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. I just wanted to ask um, something further on related to uh, Do you foresee uh, further human spaceflight collaboration with China in this respect? Or do you perhaps even potentially foresee another space race potentially developing between China and America as a result of non collaboration? I mean, what's your perspective on this? Um, we are certainly working towards collaboration. Uh, yes, and we're working towards flying a European astronaut in the Shenzhou. That's, that's what we're working towards. So, very much working towards collaboration. Um, I mean, yes, there, there, it's interesting. If China really you know, progress at the, 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 the rate that, that we expect them to, then that certainly helps other nations who might, might enter into this sort of space race environment to make, keep human spaceflight at the forefront of people's minds. But ultimately, I don't think, uh, you know, when you look at the end goal, I don't think that's necessarily what we're after. I think we need to, we need to forge with international collaboration on the next step and work there together. Um, and that would be interesting if we could bring in China into that, the next step in, in some sort of collaboration. Yes, sir. Hi, Tim. We're, we're now members of Ellipse. We have a microgravity community, which is a wonderful thing to be able to say. Your flight is not that far away, even if you were to pick up one of the last two up to 2020. Have you had any discussions about some British experiments? Because it will be a long process of peer review. Those experiments will have to win funding through the research councils. I wondered if you, you've been involved in the start of getting some British experiments to take with you. I have a little bit, Jonathan, yes. And last year, um Following on from the UK Space Agency having its microgravity conference, we, we actually formed a UK Space Biomedical Consortium because um, myself and Simon Everts, uh, Simon Everts was uh, really from a medical background, he's an ESA employee, and that was the environment we, we knew uh, in the UK, and, and he brought a lot of expertise. We started off in biomedicine. Having formed that consortium, which now has over 30 members, we grew it into a space environments working group which is, um, as now encompasses and incorporates any 
research organisation or educational organisation that wants to get involved in microgravity and the space environment? Because it's not just zero G, obviously, it's, it's vacuum, it's radiation, it's thermal extremes. Um, and the Space Environments Working Group now have the task that we've joined Ellipse, or, and also Ellipse 4 has just been trimmed because of the funding, so it's just been redefined. And within this new definition of Ellipse 4, the Space Environment Working Group has really got to identify some quick wins for the UK, which scientific experiments and which areas are ready to go at short notice so we can get them on board Ellipse through that peer review process that you mentioned and um, get them either on parabolic flights, in drop towers, on sounding rockets or on board the ISS. So I think by, by August this year we will have some, something firm from the Space Environments Working Group that will kind of have put forward these other our core quick wins. Yet, oh, definitely. And it's something that you know, we try and do at the moment. Um, lo- or two weeks ago, I was at King's College London giving a couple of presentations, and this Friday I'm at Cambridge. So we, we already try and get involved as much as possible in educational outreach. Um, and when I was on the NEMO mission, I actually did a couple of conferences from underwater as well. But it's very much a, a large part of the space mission. It's also to contact back with educational outreach uh, and speak to students and, um, and also on ham radio, for example, is another method of interaction. Uh, and that's, that's definitely part of it, so yes. Is there any particular area of your research that you're looking forward to getting your teeth into when you get up into space? Um, I think the medical area is, is what I kind of alluded to earlier. I think that's very exciting. Um, and I think that offers um, some very interesting results. So I, I think that, that would be the area that I would be interested in getting involved in. And also the human physiology is fascinating. Um, we put a lot of work and effort into countermeasures on board the station because the muscle mass deteriorates, the bone density reduces, cardiovascular effects happen because all the fluid shifts up to the, the head and the centre. Um, so your, your heart, I mean, that's, this is really the problem with the human body is it's too good. The, the body is so good at adapting to a new environment, it adapts very quickly to space flight. And the heart is suddenly offloaded, so the um, stroke volume, or the, the blood volume reduces and the stroke rate reduces. And that has a really bad effect when you then land on Earth, and it will have a bad effect when you land on Mars, 38% of Earth's gravity, but still significant gravity on Mars. So we need to work towards astronauts keeping fit in space so that they're healthy to do a mission wherever they, they land. So some of the human physiology is very exciting as well. <coughs> I think we're doing quite a lot of work in the Arctic and Antarctic with sort of possibly Mars analogs and so on, but they're looking at the physiology things. In fact, I think King's College um, got some experiments on the big mission that's just set off to cross the Antarctic in winter. Have astronauts ever been training in the Arctic or Antarctic, or is it more... You watch and learn from the results of that thing to take back because it's not something you directly... No, there have been training, actually. I don't, uh, off the top of my head, I don't think any European astronauts have, have been there yet, although Alex Gerst, who's the German European astronaut, he was there, he spent uh, six months in Concordia as a geophysicist, um, but he's not been back there as, a, um, as an astronaut. But European Space Agency have a huge input into Concordia and do a lot of research there. So there's the opportunity in the future possibly for us to do something there. Um, and I know of one NASA astronaut who I think is down there at the moment. Oh, he's but yes, yeah. he's uh, and, and actually doing something more towards meteorites um, down there, yes. Yeah. So. What's your, kind of your, um, your workload like? I'm thinking not just you, but your, your typical astronaut. Is it, you know, on one end you could think of it as being like a nine to five job. And then you know, the view, uh, another way to think of it is it's a sort of calling that you spend all your wake, working hours, your waking hours on. Where, where would you sort of sit between those two kind of extremes, <laughs> if you like? Um, I think it's... It, it tends to, for me, it tends to be in chunks because of the way the training program works out as well. So, um, if I go to Russia for five weeks to do all land training, I'm, I'm working 100% of the time five weeks. And if I'm in NASA, in, I spent a lot of time obviously in NASA last year. Um, if I'm away from home, I'm just working solid. 
that means that when I'm home in Cologne, I try and have a normal family life because you have to strike a, a work-life balance and I have two small children. So I try and make it an office, uh, office environment and just have a normal working day as much as possible. Um, but no, if, uh, I, I save all my hard work for when I'm away from home and that's when I just get down to it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I talked to an American national once who was complaining about the fact that he was uh, away from home half the time because it was Russia. I said, well, what about the Europeans? They were there away from home well, half the time in use and half the time in Russia. Can <laughs> um, you give an indication that you are not assigned to crew yet? How much time, percentage-wise, you are in Russia, in the United States, or in Europe? Um, for Luca Parmitano, and he was the Advar new class of six astronauts, he was the first one to be assigned. And he had about, his breakdown was about 55% NASA. Uh, about 40% in um, Russia, and then the rest was between Canada, Japan, and a very small amount in Europe. And because of that, he moved his family over to NASA, and they've been living there ever since. It makes sense to base yourself at least somewhere where you're 55% of the time. Um, now that's, and we have the option of doing that, and, and it depends, you know, when you get your training program, you look at where you're going to be, and you have the option of re- locating yourself and your family to that place. What's happening with us is we're actually sort of chipping away in this unassigned phase, we're chipping away at various bits of training, so I've done my EMU training, I've done my Orland training, um, next year maybe I'll do my Sawyer's right-hand seat training, which means that when you get assigned, <coughs> actually your training program is less and it might end up that you will spend more time in Europe than perhaps Luca or Alex or Samantha would have done. So it just is a very individual case by case basis. Have you thought about what Andre did flying home every weekend? <laughs> um, I mean, that's, that's pretty tough as well. But then at least you have a stable, your family is stable with family yeah. support. Not quite what you're about. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Um, so, I, no, again, it's case by case. I have to see, have to see how the training program will work out. Tim, the um, difference between when you're doing EVA between the Russian uh, Orlan and the American EMU, Mm. Uh, are they very different? Is one better than the other? Do you sort of have a Um, preference? It's funny, they are different. The... I, I would describe the Orland as a comfy sofa. Um, you kind of get in through the back, and it's easy to get in. You just open, open the hatch and slide your, your legs, in the, and in you get. Glove size is a small, medium, and large. Close it, and uh, it's all quilted and soft, and off you go. Um, the EMU has about 45 uh, sizes of glove, for example. Uh, it's extremely hard to get into and out of. Um, but if I were to compare the two, the EMU, the, the NASA spacesuit, that's really, I felt, where you can do some serious work because um, the suit just, uh, although it, was, it is tough on the body, <coughs> it allows you that extra dexterity, a bit of extra maneuverability. I found in the all and often my arms would get locked into a position and you have to do this sort of oop, funny maneuvers like this to free up your arms again. Um, and whilst it's comfortable, you don't have the dexterity and you don't have the maneuverability to do, do some tasks. Yes. Um, when I was at the, I went to the International Space University last summer, and we were lectured by a few people, and quite a few of them seemed to have an issue with the UK really not paying its way at ESA, and not just kind of picking and choosing the bits that suited them, and they kind of looked down their noses, so I kept quiet about being English. Um, I, just, I just wondered, have you found any kind of atmosphere around the fact that you got selected, even though the UK wasn't paying into the manned space flight program? I, has that yeah. actually changed since you know, the latest material? Um, I haven't actually. It's been something that I've been, I was ready for and I was kind of expecting it as well. But um, I've been very fortunate that there hasn't been any of that kind of atmosphere that I've been aware of at all. But I, I do know exactly what you're saying. And there is, I mean, there's an incredibly political environment and, you know, they're made up of so many member states all with these voluntary contributions and mandatory contributions. So it's bound to have some impact. Um, but no, on the whole, it's been a very good working environment and I haven't had any negative aspects of that at all. The ministerial has been interesting because, um, yes, people have been delighted that the UK has contributed, 
um, albeit, you know, uh, not as significant as Germany or France, but we're in, we're in the club, we've contributed, and we've you know, joined Ellipse, as Jonathan has mentioned there. Um, I think the real test will be flight assignment. And, um, I mean, for example, there's a 2015 long-duration flight assignment coming up. Now, the, the, there's a correct order of March, if you like, in terms of a, a political point of view, but then there are other factors in there. So maybe that will change things, I don't know, but we'll just have to deal with that as it comes. I mean, Britain now and manager contributed to it, so even if not... Yes, absolutely. And, that, and that's something I've said as well. You're absolutely right. We're now the third largest contributor uh, above Italy now. Um, and you have to look at it holistically. And um, when robotics and human spaceflight were merged under one directorate, well, under today's circumstances, the UK would be a major contributor into that because we obviously have a huge influence in the robotics environment. It's just so that robotics and human spaceflight have since been detached, and so the human spaceflight element we left not much. So it's just pots of money in different directorates and organisations. So, uh, and I think our current director general is extremely. Um, good uh, and it's kind of brought a fresh approach in understanding that and realising that uh, everybody is bringing something to different parts of ESA but we have to work as a whole uh, yes. um, <coughs> Presumably you work with both male and female colleagues um, do the female colleagues have a significant different approach in, in, in any type of way or do they, are they exactly like the male as far as approach? Um, I think everybody has a slightly different approach based on their background. There's so much diversity, and I, I wouldn't say it's anything to do with f female, male, not at all. But, um, for example, I was working with Dottie, um, who was the commander on the Nemo 16. Now, she came from a teaching environment. Samantha, uh, the Italian colleague at uh, ESA, she comes from a uh, scientific engineering and a fast jet Italian Air Force pilot background. So people, you just take people with their backgrounds and their personality. Uh, we've got medical doctors, we've got engineers, we've got geophysicists, test pilots... Um, and that's where you get the fun. You get, um, you know, sometimes stereotyped personalities, but we all get on extremely well together. And it's, that's much more, um, it, it really dictates people's personality than whether they're male or female. Have there been any romances that have blossomed? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's been quite a lot of high profile failures in the. In the the broader Russian space pr program, and um, do you think those kind of glory days of, of Russian space exploration are really gone? <coughs> it, 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 do you think that's a possibility that they, they could recover and that the quality get better and, and get bigger budgets? Yeah, I'd like to think that they can recover and will recover. Um, thankfully, the, the Soyuz FG is, I think, it's, it's got over 40 launches with 100% success rate now, so that's you know, in this human space flight, it's got a very good record. But yes, uh, there have been failures of the proton and um, in terms of uh, reaching satellite payloads, reaching orbit. So there is some work to be done, definitely, but hopefully they'll recover. <laughs> I, I do get asked that quite a bit, and it's a really, it's a really hard question to answer. Um, because as I was alluding to earlier, we, all of my colleagues, we come from such a diverse background. There is no set route to follow. As, as Nick said, I, I left school at 18, I worked in a bar, and then I went on Operation Rally to Alaska and joined the Army. Um, I got a degree when I was 32 in flight dynamics, um, and, and, and it was my, really my operational <coughs> background and my career as a test pilot that um, enabled me to go for the position as astronauts. Other people have gone straight through academia, uh, got their doctorates, and then become astronauts straight out the back of, of a doctorate with you know, relatively little operational experience. But we all bring something different. So it's very hard to tell people what you should do. Um, I think the main thing is everyone is, who I work with is very passionate about what they do, and they've always tried to be as good as they can be. I think that we're getting into an area where future astronauts are being selected more on um, psychology and personality 
than, their, than perhaps the educational backgrounds and, and skills and qualifications because that's becoming a feature of long duration space flight. And it was certainly a major feature of our selection process with psychological profiling and personality. One yeah. more question for this one. The um, Mars 500 simulation, I mean, it's interesting sort of talking about psychological aspects. Um, I believe that they actually had some problems with the crew who undertook that, that simulation. And um, what a, I don't know whether you're sort of familiar with any of the lessons they might have learned from that, you know, um, for I, I, to be quite honest, I haven't had a huge amount of feedback from the Mars 500 in terms of the data. Um, one of the participants has actually just started working at the European uh, Space Agency, and it's possible that a second participant will as well, actually at the European National Centre in Cologne. Um, so I hope to have the opportunity to speak to those individuals and actually gain uh, more insight as to what they went through. But I had heard that it was a very successful mission and they did identify some areas that needed focus and attention, but on the whole, there wasn't a huge amount of um, conflict and, and most areas were resolved quite well. Um, my personal take on that is you, you can learn some valuable lessons by those kind of space analogues, but if I were to put myself in the shoes of uh, going on a real Mars mission, one of those from a psychological point of view, one of the overriding factors is that element of risk in terms of once you leave Earth's orbit and you're off to Mars. Um, you know, you really are in a very high risk environment for a very long period of time. Um, and also the real effects of the body in terms of your physiology, maintaining your health in that <coughs> environment. So by having that element removed, you're, you can't simulate that in a space analogue. So you have to be wary of the lessons learned. You, know, you have to be very careful about what you extract from something like that. I do think there's, there's good value to do it, and there's valuable information to get out of it, but you just have to be a bit careful. <coughs> Tim, that, that was absolutely terrific. I mean, the, the, uh, you showed some brand new material, which we, we, I certainly hadn't seen, but most, most of us hadn't seen Lovely to see you on Nemo wearing the Union flag. Yes. That's, that's a really uh, <laughs> nice touch. Tried right? to get it into the shot wherever I could. <laughs> yeah, well done, well done. And terrific also when you were doing the, um, the Hydrolab work in the States, there was a Union flag on the wall. Great stuff. Yes, that's yeah. fantastic. Which leads me to a couple, I'll say a couple of things, just sort of a bit of a wind up. Alice is going to make, uh, make a, a couple of things in terms of presentations to you. But um, first of all, we're, both of us are wearing the BIS Human Spaceflight Badge, yeah, which right. I'd, I'd like to say a quick word about, because there was, this started around about 2007, we were campaigning as a society to try and get um, yourself, actually, not you personally, but, but a British astronaut, yes. and it, it actually worked. Now, we don't know, we don't really know what was in Lord Drayson's mind at the time, back in 2007, 8, and, and I'd like to think there was some little subliminal influence going on. So that, that explains the badge. The other one is the, um, the silver pin badge, which is coming up. We've got one for you. <laughs> this will be for when you've done your orbital flight. And the, so far, obviously, it's been five awarded to British born astronauts. Mm -hmm. And yours is, yours is waiting there. You, you may be beaten into space, of course, <laughs> because I suspect Virgin Galactic, um, David Mackay, chief yeah, test yeah. pilot. Uh, Virgin Galactic will be beating you into space, but not orbital mm. space. At the moment, we're not awarding a, a <coughs> silver pin for space. We may have a bronze one, possibly. <laughs> 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 we should say. So I think you're, you're, you're on the car, so let's, let's <coughs> let's tourists, we don't. Uh, there is tourists. There is, of course, Sarah Bryan. Of course, yes. But we're, we're yet to see whether yeah. she beats you. And I do but, wish uh, those projects <laughs> the best success. You know, I, I have Virgin Galactic and Sarah, uh, and Sarah Brightman we'll, we'll as well. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's for the future. I like to think if you made it to the moon, it'd be a, a gold one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. But um, Tim, thank you so much. Um, final thought for me, Alison's about to come on the set. Um, I did a piece a few years ago, but before you were around, uh, and uh, The Guardian called it, um, it was about British astronauts. 
the, the Guardian called it um, Britain needs a new Dan Dare. Um, I'd love to think, I mean, you're a major, Dan Dare was a colonel. So <laughs> <laughs> I've got years, some work to do, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and Dan Dare had, had, had a, uh, a colleague called Digby, who was his assistant. Maybe there's a younger yeah. member in the audience who, uh, <laughs> one day, maybe the, you know, a future colleague of yours on the ISS or uh, on, who knows, on asteroid mission or whatever. Mm -hmm. But Tony, anyway, best of luck for the future. We're really looking forward to hearing you come and talk again to us uh, in, in due course. Um, I think we'd just like to say thank you and a quick round, round of applause if we may. Right, well, thank you very much. That was excellent. Enjoyed every word of it. Thank you very now, much. Now, we've got a few things here. What we'd like to do, first of all, <laughs> is so that you know a little bit about us when you actually fly, we'd like to present you with the British Interplanetary Fantastic. book. That's the complete history, which thank will be interesting Alex. reading on while you're up there. <laughs> <laughs> now, I shall pack you my personal give, allowance. And these are, these are actually now on, on the website. You can buy them yourselves. But I'd like to give you about six of these, which are, in fact, mats to stick on your, on your dashboard. Right. Fantastic. But they might be useful because they stick anything to anything. Oh, right. And wow. So okay. They are, in fact, the BIS 80th anniversary little gift. Fantastic. So you can spread them around your East Rastos. I could have done with one of these on Nemo, but th thank yeah, you very uh, much. Uh, they do work underwater, <laughs> and you can wash them as well. So, Wonderful. Uh, and I've discovered they're perfect for holding tiles down when you're drilling and, and, and actually cutting <laughs> tiles. So that's, that's one way of looking at it. Now, to be a little bit more serious, I was asked by the Council of the British Implantary Society to invite you to become a Fellow of the Society. And we would be, be very pleased if you would accept this award. And so if you are able to accept it, this is your certificate to actually invite you to become a member. And you are now, therefore, a member, Fantastic. sorry, a fellow <laughs> of the British Interplanetary Society. Thank you very much. And it would be, be great to have one, one of our own fellows actually up in orbit. Because I don't, it's not quite a first, we don't think, but it's uh, one of the first. And there's a little letter to go with it. Fantastic. to actually explain what oh, it all means. Absolute pleasure and a privilege to accept. Thank you very much. Well, and so that you don't go away completely empty-handed, <laughs> 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 we'd like to present you with the tie as well so that it can replace that one at, at Wonderful. occasions yes, and absolutely. remind you of, of where you've come from. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you.